So 2-6, we are getting into those numbers that I actually talked to you kind of at the beginning of the year about. I said, hey, there's things called real numbers, and then I said there's these things that are kind of more like your friends, which are called imaginary numbers. Okay, imaginary numbers exist, uh, and we're going to talk about how, where they come from, what they look like, uh, and so let's start off with some basic rules. So if I asked you, what's the square root of 25? Does everybody agree with that? Anyone argue on that? It's just five. What's the answer to that? Wrong. All right, so first off, let's talk about what these two questions ask. Because understanding what the question asks is half the battle. What is this question asking for? It's asking, what's the square root of 25? And the answer for that is 5. What is the original question asking here? What does it mean when I have an x? It means that I have an unknown. And I'm really asking you, what number, what does squaring really mean? What number times itself equals 25? Yes, 5 does work. But so does negative 5. And when you tell me x equals 5, you've left off a number, and that's wrong. Because in math, I need you to show me all the answers. So if you would have left x equals 5, that would be incorrect. Now, some of you are looking at this going, wait, this doesn't make sense. How does this equal 5 over here, and how does it equal the square root of 5 with uh, plus or minus 5 over here? Who put the square root of 5 or 25 in this problem? Was it part of the original equation or did I do it to solve something working backwards? Was this part of the original equation or did I put it in there meaning like I was working backwards and I had to undo something? This was just part of the equation. It was just part of the question. So if someone asks you, what's the square root of 100? What's the answer? 10. Notice the difference here. Is there a square root in this problem right now? How do we undo squaring something, though? But who put the square root sign in there? I did. So whenever you put the square root sign in there, you've got to put this plus or minus symbol in there. This did not occur to me until I was in college. It was embarrassing. The teacher put something like the square root of 36 up there. And they said, what's the answer? And everyone in my class said plus or minus six and he said wrong we were so used to doing these problems right here that we put plus or minus over there what should be the answer to this question six what's the answer to this question do we see the difference between the two i didn't realize that until i was in college pretty sad right no one no other no teacher brought that to my attention so really the question here is, what number times itself, right, can equal 25? It's the best way for me to explain it. All right, so here's what happens today. Or if we have this. Your teacher in middle school did not say this, but most of them do, and I can't stand it. When I was teaching, I made sure I did not say this. Some kids ask questions, well, what happens if you have a negative under a square root, or what happens? And a lot of middle school teachers say what? You can't put a negative. And that's terrible. That's a lie. It's awful. It's like, you remember when I was telling you when I'm teaching, like, my, if I was teaching a five-year-old, four-year-old, about numbers. Do they know about negative numbers? So will they go five minus ten? They would go, you can't do that because five is smaller than ten. Is that really true that you can't do this problem? No, it's just that they're not ready to understand that concept yet. 
we have to build them up. So we teach them, you know, one through ten first. Then we teach them one through hundred. Then maybe we start talking about decimals. Then we start talking about negative numbers as you get to middle school, right? We allow your brain to start to understand and comprehend things, right? We introduce it to you slowly. Well, guess what? I don't think it would have been really fun if you were in sixth grade going, hey, there's imaginary numbers. You'd be like, wait, now I've got variables, now I've got imaginary. We, we give it to you nice and easy. So your teacher should have said, you're not able to do this yet, but it is possible. You'll find that out in high school. That's what I used to tell my kids. When that question ever came up, I'd be like, yes, it's possible. No, it's not possible for you right now because you don't know about these numbers. So you'll get to it in just a couple years. And I think that that does a better job than me teaching you that, no, this can't be done. Does that make sense? So this is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on how to see with these guys, what they make, what they look like, um, and all that kind of stuff. All right, so imaginaries. All right, so imaginary number is such that I squared equals negative 1. So if I squared equals negative 1, what does I equal? Don't worry about the plus or minus for this one. If I had I squared, what would I just equal? Don't worry about the plus or minus. If I had I squared equals negative 1, what does that mean I equals? How do I undo squaring? What did we just say? Square root of negative 1. So anytime you see an I, you're going to replace it with, or it could be replaced with the square root of negative 1. What did we just say I squared equals? Now, what would that mean that I to the third equals? Or equals? How can I rewrite I to the third? This will review. See, when we do all this fun stuff, we're relying on knowing some algebra 1. We're going to rely on algebra 1 all year. It's unbelievable. Hopefully you remember from algebra 1, you can rewrite this as i squared times i to the first. Because what happens when you have the same base and they're raised to powers? What do you do with their two powers? I. And what's 2 plus 1? So can I rewrite i to the third as i to the second times i to the first? Yes. The reason I want to do that is what's i to the uh, first? Or I to the second, let's do that one first, is negative 1 times square root of negative 1. What does that mean that I to the third really equals? Negative square root of negative 1. Are you following me where I got all that stuff from? So this would be negative square root of negative 1. Draw up with me. I to the fourth. What do you think I'm going to rewrite that as? I would not want to write it as i to the third times i to the first. Those have square roots in them. Uh, if I can, do I want to deal with, if I don't have to deal with square roots, do I want to deal with them? Heck no. So, yes, you could write it as that, but that's not the easiest way. The easiest way would be i to the second times i to the second. What's i to the second? Negative one. What's another one? A negative one. What happens when you multiply negative one and negative one? You get a positive one. How we doing? All right. I to the fifth. Then we're going to try to see a pattern here in a second. What can I write I to the fifth? What's the easiest one that I want to use as much as I can? I to the fourth. Why? Because it's just a one. So can I write this as I to the fourth times I, which would be one times what? Square root of negative one, which just equals square root of negative one. What do you notice about these two guys? I and I to the fifth. The same. With me? 
Let's do another one. Let's jump around. Let's do I to the 11. How do you think I want to write that? I to the fourth times I to the fourth. What one did I say we want to use as much as we can? Y. What does it replace to? The easiest one, right? Just a one. And then this B times I to the how much is left over? Third. Well, these just are 1 times 1 times I to the third is really negative square root of negative 1. So what is I to the 11th really equal to? Negative square root of negative 1. Anyone notice in the pattern here? Make a prediction. What do you think I to the 6 is going to become? What do you think I to the 12th is going to become? One. What do you think I to the 9th is going to become? Does anyone have a way I can figure this out? Like, what if I wanted to say I 75? What is that really equivalent to? <laughs> Same as this one? How did you get that? Okay. Here's the here's the way that I do this. How many different chart how many different things are there in this chart? Does four go into four? One. Any left over? How many does it go into eight? Any left over? What are you noticing about this column right here? The remainder is what? Zero when you divide by what number? Okay, let's try this. If I divided seven, or let, we could even do three. Does four go into three? It goes into it zero times with what? A remainder of? Three left over. How many times does it go into seven? One time with what? Three left over. If you take four and divide it by seven, I'm sorry, seven divided by four. Four goes into it one time. Remember old school. Four goes into seven. You would go, it goes into it one time. Four, when you subtract, what are you getting left over? Three. Old school. Yes? What happens in this, what I do to 11? What's the remainder? Three. What's the remainder for this one going to be? Two. What's the remainder for this one going to be? So if I wanted to figure out what is I to the 75 really equivalent to, what do I have to do? I take 75, and I say, how many times does 4 go into 75? Oops. Do I really care how many times 4 goes into it? Is that what I'm after? What am I after? The remainder. So I go, 4 goes into 7, 1 time, 4, there's 3, 5, 4 goes into 35, how many times? Eight, and that gets me to 32. Here's what I'm after. What's the leftover when I subtract that? Three. So what is I to the 75 really the equivalent to? The same thing as I to the third. Are you with me? And then I get that to be negative square root of negative one. Because essentially, what am I doing? Every time I can write i to the fourth, I'm writing it. So that's why I'm dividing it by four. 
Because I'm seeing every time I can write I to the fourth, I to the fourth, I to the fourth, I to the fourth, I to the fourth. Because I to the fourth becomes what? Just a one. So if I had like I to the, let's do 21st. Really I'm writing that as I to the fourth times 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 I to the fourth. How many times does 4 go into 20? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? But the problem is, that only gets me to, this is 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. How many I's did I originally have? 21. So what am I missing? Uh, one more I. So what is really, I to the 21st power is really equivalent to just I. which is square root of negative 1. Are you with me on how I'm finding this? Are we good? Here's some more examples of how they did this. I would not do it the way that... I would probably do this this way. I like her way. You can look at Tristan's way. It works out. I would not write it like that. I think that's more complex than what I just explained to you. This person did it like this. Would that work out also? Yes, it would. If you have I to the 15th power, doesn't mean you just have 15 I's. And every time you have the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, doesn't that really turn into the square root? Of negative one what? Squared? What happens with square and square roots? And turn into negative one. Do so you see how this person did that? I don't recommend that. I think that would take forever on your test. Especially when I give you I to the 99th. Have fun writing all those I's. You won't finish my test. Correct? How are you supposed to do this one? What did I tell you to do? Take 99 and do what? Divide by 4 and figure out how many are left over. If you do that on the calculator, you're going to get a decimal. How do you figure out how much is left over then? Like let's say I take, when I did that 75, if I put that in a calculator, it's going to get me, if I take 75 and divide it by 4 in a calculator, it's going to give me 18.75. How could I figure out how much is left over? How many times does 4 go into it fully without going over? Are you with me? I would then hit my calculator. 4 times 18, which is 72. 75 minus 72 is the 3, where I get my remainder from. Because I know we don't know how to figure that kind of, that would probably throw us off. You with me? So that's how you could do it using a calculator. For homework, you're supposed to do these. It's only one tricky one. If you had, like, um, four goes into the like, perfectly, it's just going to give you one. Yep. That's how many are left over? Zero. Yep. So, like, we could do a problem together real quick. What one do you know 4 is going to go into? How about C? Oh, it's 400, right? Does, does 4 go into that? So what do I know this is going to be? Okay, I did one problem for you for homework. You're welcome. That's how long it should take on your test. If you're taking 20 minutes on this problem, there's an issue. You don't know your stuff. What should you be doing with every one of these numbers? I to the 93rd, what should you do? Divide by... Four. How many are left over? 206. Divide by 4. How many are left over? That should take you all of, um, not even a minute, guys. But that's the problem. We don't know our stuff. So I take 20 minutes on a problem like this. Not going to work. The only one that's kind of tricky is D, but you should know how to deal with a negative and a, a, a root or a power. What happens when you have a negative and a power? Where does it send it? Denominator. If you have, uh, if you had a number like x to the negative 3, 
That is really equivalent to 1 over x to the third. This extends to the bottom, or it can also bring it up to the top. So if I had like 1 over x to the negative 2, what does the negative 2 tell this to do? Go up, and it becomes just x to the second. Notice all it did is it used the negative sign. When I put it down or bring it up, it gets rid of the positive or the negative sign. These are interchangeable, by the way, meaning I can go this way. I can also go this way. Here, these are interchangeable. I can go this way. I can also go this way. We're going to use that in Algebra 2. That's a review from something from Algebra 1. That's the tricky part. You with me? All right. From now on, whenever you see a negative under a square root, you are going to write i. Here's what I mean. As soon as I see this guy right here, I can break that up into this right away. I would even skip this step. I'm okay with you skipping that step and going to right to here. As soon as you see the square root of negative 75, you should rewrite that as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 75. And again, that's an algebra 1 skill. Algebra 1 said, hey, if you have square root of 2, times the square root of 2, you can actually multiply those together and make that become square root of 4, which is just 2. I did an easy one for you. Algebra 1 said you can combine them together. Well, not only does it say that you can combine them together, but you can also do what? Break them apart. What am I doing with the negative 75? I'm breaking it apart into a negative 1 times 75. And they're both under square root signs. So it's like I'm doing the opposite of what I learned in Algebra 1, which is totally okay. If you're allowed to go one way, you can also go the other way. Yes? So, yeah, they, they like, could not multiply by uh, 1 out of a square in a sense. I don't understand your question. Like, if, if, if we were to... Okay. So the way that they said, this is... So, the, that's, so this is Algebra 1. So what... The algebra 2 part is right here. This is all the algebra 2 part is. You break this up. That's actually an algebra 1 skill to be able to break it up. The algebra 2 skill is as soon as I see a negative square root of 1, what does it become? That's it. That's algebra 2. The rest of this problem of breaking the square root of 75 down into 5 square roots of 3 is an algebra 1 skill. If you did that in algebra 1, we would give you problems like this. And the way that they taught it in Carnegie and probably in other books, which I don't like, I'll teach you probably another way here shortly, is they said you could break this up into a number that has a perfect square and whatever goes into it. And they said, well, 25 has a square root, and I can times it by 3. 25 times 3 is 75. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. And then you can break the square root of that is a 5, square roots of 3. Now, why is this different over here? Because we have 5 square roots of 3, and then there's that i. Now, I normally write it like this, 5i square roots of 3. The reason I write it like that is sometimes kids get a little long with their square root, and they put it like that, and it's hard for me to tell, is the i under the square root, or is it outside of it? So what I do is I write the i before the square root so that it doesn't get confusing for me, because this, if it's underneath the square root, is a wrong. These are not the same answers. Does that make sense? So I always write the I right here, in between. Yes. Just make sure you win your square root, because like I said, it gets, this is what kids write. Because you want to put the I right behind the three, and then it, is that I underneath the square root or not? Your guess is as good as mine. Is the I under the square root in this one right here? No. You can tell that right away. There's no questions. This one is a little bit more sticky. So I would try to write it like this. All right. We can look at some other people, what they did. How did she do this wrong? What did she do? Say it again. She 
got no she's got no eye in this and as soon as I see this right here I know there's gonna have to be an eye are you with me on that now what happens here she just pulled the negative outside the square root is that acceptable to be able to do no that's where she went wrong that's where she went wrong all right here's some other ones is Jen or Tammy correct what one do you think? Amy is going to be correct. What did I say? As soon as we see the square root, it's kind of like there's supposed to be parentheses. Like you have to do this first. You have to take care of the imaginary part first before you can multiply those guys together. So what happens is this becomes a 2i, and this becomes a 2i. Remember I said as soon as you see a square root of a negative, pull out the imaginary part. Are you with me? And then what happens when you have i squared? What is i squared really equivalent to? What do we learn in our chart? It's really equal to a negative 1. And then what happens when you have 4 times a negative 1? You get a negative 4. So a couple things you need to know. As soon as you see a square root under a negative sign, what should you replace it with? Pull that I out real quick. What should you see as soon as you put an uh, I squared? What should you replace that with from now on? Negative 1. So here's what I mean. As soon as I see this, square root of negative 54. If I was doing this problem, what would be my first step that I would do? What did I do first? Because it's really like me writing it as square root of negative 1 times the square root of 54. What is the square root of negative 1? Ah. Remember, we're not changing values. We're changing the way things look. That's it. Now, then how would I attack this problem is I would deal with the square root of 54, and I'd have to make sure that I, you know, it would become... Uh, I square root of 9 times the square root of 6. 9 has a square root. That's why I used 9 and 6. Notice, every time I'm using this, are there other numbers that go into 54? Sure. Why did I not use them? Because they don't have a square root. I only want to use at least one of my numbers has to have a square root. And I want the biggest one. What would have happened if 6 would have had another square root inside of it? You'd have to pull it out or else I'd be making a mistake here. Does 4 go into 54? No. What I'm trying to explain to you is, if there's another number over here, if I didn't, remember how we had to use the greatest common factor when we divided, when we were, like, canceling out fractions? And if you didn't use the biggest, you didn't simplify it far enough? Oh. Like if I did uh, 12 over 16. 4 goes into both these numbers, right? But when I was learning this fraction, a lot of kids did 2. And they said, oh, if I do this as 2, it becomes 6 eighths. And what did your teacher do? Why did they mark it wrong? Because there's another number that goes into this. Are you with me? Well, what if I would have pulled out, and this does have a square root, but over here, there was something else that has a square root? If you don't pull that out, you haven't simplified it far enough. Are you kind of with me there? So you've got to check that and make sure you don't make a mistake. So this should be 3i square root of 6 would be the answer for this question. So it's not that you can't have two square roots. It's just that you can as long as you simplify the whole. Sure. But in the end, I want, the reason I'm splitting them up is I want them to be able to have, one of them to have a square root. That's, it's like simplifying a fraction. I'm trying to pull out everything that I can. And if you don't, you haven't simplified it and it will be wrong. You'll lose points on your test. Yes. The easiest way to describe this would be like with a number that 4 and 16 both go into. And if I just divide it by 4, I'll be able to find the 6. Like take that out and get a 2. But there'll be another 4 that's stuck inside there and I wouldn't have reduced it far enough. Kind of like this idea. Where not only did 2 go into, but 4 went into it. And when you don't reduce it far enough, 
The answer is technically wrong. You'll probably just lose a couple points. But a couple points adds up. Yes? Right, that's what I'm saying. Now kids sometimes just go to the smallest and easiest one. Yes, you're on the right track. You want the biggest square root that can go into these numbers. All right. For homework, go ahead and try this one, this one, and this one. <laughs> when you do this, you're going to end up with what is called a complex number. This is an example of a complex number. The reason that it's called complex is the number 10 is just a real number. It's just the ones that we've dealt with all our, our lives. We call them real numbers. Everybody with me? So this is a real number. What do we learn this is called? Imaginary. So when you have a real part and you have an imaginary part together, we call those a complex number. So this is an example of a complex number. How would you attack number or letter A? What's the square root of 64? Eight. Eight. That's going to be my real part. Then I have to attack this guy right here, and that's going to be my imaginary. Can these guys combine? No. It's like me saying 10 plus 5x. Can I combine those? Because these guys are not like terms. These guys are not like terms. You're going to have that similar thing happening down here. Does everybody understand how you're supposed to attack the square root of... Uh, 63. Negative 63, sorry. Feel com confident in this? Questions on it? And tomorrow we're going to start with problem 2, and then I have a video for the rest of it. So we'll be finished with 6. Uh, uh.